all fully awake, including myself. <laughs> I had already plenty of espresso. Um, actually, I had planned to uh, give a, a, another set of lectures which you have a PDF copy of, which is called Principles of Selection. But I, we're going to skip over that. Um, we might talk about some of this stuff towards the end of the class, if there's uh, still time. But I think I brought too much material with me. Um, and I think we're going to continue with this, because this actually connects quite naturally to, to what we had talked about yesterday and the day before. Uh, in that part that I'm going to skip, principles of selection, uh, I can briefly summarize what this is all about. It's, that's mainly um, um, a set of lectures talking about the basic mathematical theory of, of selection, where you have selection acting on single loci. Usually we think of single loci with two alleles. But when, when I looked through what you guys have done with John Rice, he actually used the price equation, which I'm not going to talk about, to derive simple selection equations, which are equations that you can use to calculate how allele frequencies change if you have selection operating, how allele frequencies change from one generation to the next. And so the lectures in this PDF, the principles of selection, mainly talk about this for the haploid and the diploid case and what happens when you have recessive beneficial alleles or dominant uh, beneficial alleles and so forth. So I'm going to skip over that. Um, and today we will uh, talk about this. We'll see whether we get through this. If not, we, we finish this tomorrow, I hope. And so this is about how we can now use what we've talked about to detect selection using sequencing data. That's obviously not the only approach there is. I mean, we can study selection just looking at phenotypes, for example. But of course, population geneticists are interested in the underlying genetics. And the question is, how can we use genetic data to infer selection? And so the reason for why we've talked over the last two days about all these measures of genetic variability and genetic differentiation is in a way to prepare us for what I'm going to talk about today, which is how we can use sequencing data to, to uh, find signatures of selection. So again, I would like to thank these people um, for material that's uh, contained in this lecture. It's amazing what you can find on the internet. Um, and so here's the outline. So in this lecture, we'll discuss how molecular data can be used to detect selection. And so this can be done in different ways. And one common way how people do this is by comparing sequence divergence between closely related species with polymorphism data from within species. So these are comparisons that where you need at least two closely related species and you look at genetic differentiation or divergence between them and you compare that to the amount of polymorphism within each of these species. And that contains information about selection, for example. Then we can also work as, as simply within species only. So for example, within Homo sapiens or within Drosophila or whatever, by using patterns of genetic variability and the statistics of variant frequency distributions within species. For example, to infer what we call selective sweeps. And I will uh, explain to you what selective sweeps are. I believe Sean has also briefly mentioned them. So we can also use data from within species. And so that's why over the last two days we talked a lot about these different measures of genetic variability, things like pi or theta Watterson and so forth. <clears throat> And then we can more generally do what, what people call genome scans. You can sequence an entire genome of an organism, of a bunch of individuals, maybe from two different populations that are ecologically interesting because like the, the individuals in these two populations might be interesting and you might think, okay, so maybe there's adaptation involved uh, in, in these local differences. And so you can do sort of genome scans, scanning along the genome to see whether you find really intriguing patterns that are not easily explained by other things than selection. Of course, you can't be totally sure, as we've mentioned yesterday. Um, so for example, people use this, as we have mentioned yesterday, using these FST outliers. 
FST being, again, this measure of genetic differentiation that I briefly mentioned yesterday. I didn't really tell you how to calculate or estimate this. Um, there's different ways of doing that. Uh, for DNA sequencing data, um, for DNA sequencing data, if we go briefly to the, to the blackboard, um, So if we have sequencing data, we can uh, sort of estimate it this way, for example. And so I'm, I'm putting this up because you already know what pi is. Pi is nucleotide variability. And so here we have between and within. What does that mean? Between means that we're comparing, for example, two different populations, right? So population one and population two. Maybe they differ in some interesting aspects of the environment and we think like, okay, these guys are adapted to this sort of, you know, environment and these guys are adapted to a slightly different niche. They're, they're the same species, but we wonder, you know, are, to what extent are they different? And we can do that by calculating uh, pi between, compare pi between these populations and compare it to sort of pi within a population, sort of the pooled pi within the populations. And, and then we can look at this measure and that tells us how genetically different uh, these populations are. And again, FST can range from zero to one, where one means that these guys are completely distinct. One example would be that if I look at the particular nucleotide position or a particular uh, locus, all these guys are fixed for the capital A allele and all these guys are fixed for the little a allele, right? And so that tells me that these two populations are, are completely distinct from each other and that could be due to selection, but it could also be due to other things. And FST will be zero if there's complete panmixis, we say, complete random mating. There's no difference in, in, the, in the allele frequencies between these two populations. They're indistinguishable. So that's, that's FST. Right, so let's go back to the to the slides, right, so we can do these things. Again, uh, I'm gonna make references to the book by Brian and Deborah on the slides. And just before we get into this, and you've already heard about this, it might be useful as a, as a, as a brief recap to say that there's different, um, there's different forms of selection that we can talk about. So uh, you might have heard of purifying selection which acts to prevent the spread of deleterious mutations, those that affect the amino acid sequences of proteins. So this is a very commonly used term. Sometimes people also say negative selection because it involves deleterious mutations or purifying selection is, is a standard terminology. And then this is, can be opposed to what people call positive directional selection. So this is positive selection of beneficial mutations and the direction is like to increase the frequency of these beneficial mutations. There's another form that is also positive selection that you have heard about from Sean, which is balancing selection. Balancing selection is also a form of positive selection because it involves adaptive beneficial mutations or alleles, but it's not directional. Balancing selection does not tend to increase the frequency of one variant over the other. Balancing selection maintains polymorphism. So in the, in the simplest case, balancing selection, for example, over dominance or heterozygous advantage, as we call, call it, maintains both alleles if there's two alleles, not just one. So it's positive selection, but not directional selection. So positive directional selection causes an adaptive mutation to spread to fixation if that mutation is lucky enough to survive genetic drift because at the beginning, mutations, even if they're beneficial, are obviously very rare, and they might be lost by drift again. So the mutation needs to be sort of lucky enough to spread some to some initial frequency so that selection can see it and push it up in frequency. So this will be positive directional selection. 
and balancing selection maintains alternative variants in the, in the population. As Sean has also uh, explained to you, there's different forms of balancing selection. The, the easiest to uh, sort of um, conceive of or think about is what we call heterozygote advantage or overdominance. This simply means that the heterozygote is fitter than either homozygote, okay? So I have capital A, capital A homozygotes, I have little a, little a homozygotes, and what I'm saying is capital A, little a is fitter than either of those. And then we have over dominance or heterozygote advantage. So sickle cell anemia, or this example with this glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase that we talked about yesterday, these are examples uh, of, of heterozygote advantage or over dominance. But, as Sean has also explained to you, there can be other forms of balancing selection, for example, negative frequency-dependent selection. A lot of students have problems understanding negative frequency-dependent selection because fitness somehow changes as the frequency changes of, of the types. The easiest way to imagine this, or the, a slogan to sort of remember what this is, is like, this is the advantage of being rare. You have an advantage, as a type if you're rare. But if there's too many of, of the same type around, you're losing that advantage. So for example, if you're a parasite, you might be able to exploit the host because you have a new mutation that the host has not been able to evolve resistance to. You're brand new. You're really good at attacking the host. But the more of you there are, I mean, so you're going to increase in frequency because you're so successful at exploiting the host. But as you get more frequent, the host is exposed to more of you guys, right? And will evolve counter resistance. And so you have an advantage when you're rare. But once you get too common, you're losing that advantage. So that's negative frequency dependent selection. And so both balancing and positive directional selection are often referred to as positive selection. And so we'll talk a little bit about both. Um, negative or purifying selection and positive selection. That's why I'm mentioning this. So this is just a brief recap of all the stuff I'm going to skip, which is like this lecture that is called Principles of Selection, because I've seen that you've done this in a way. You can read more about this in Chapter 2 in the, in the Charlesworth and Charlesworth textbook. And so uh, in, that, in that other PDF that you have um, for download, uh, a big part of that is like to talk about deterministic single locus selection theory. So have you heard of Fisher, Haldane, and Wright? Who has heard of these three gentlemen? Do you know Fisher, these guys? Uh, huh? Yes? So Fisher is super famous, right? Because pretty much every second concept we have in modern statistics, like likelihood, F value in ANOVA, all this stuff comes from Fisher. But he was a super famous population geneticist, and so was Haldane in Britain and Wright. And these three guys were the founding fathers of population genetics. And in fact, it's these people who worked out these simple equations, especially uh, Fisher and, and Haldane. And so here, I'm just going to show you this equation that you have seen in this or another form. Uh, you can derive this, as, uh, as we have discussed yesterday. You can actually uh, derive this from, uh, from the Wright-Fisher and Moran model. You can derive it from the price equation, which is the, the price equation is the most gener general equation we have to describe evolutionary change, as, as Sean has explained. So the price equation is like really high up in the hierarchy, and all the other equations we have in evolutionary biology sort of kind of like can be derived from the price equation, including this business here. So what do we have here? So let, let's look at the single locus with two alleles. And what we want to figure out is how the allele frequency changes from time t to time t plus 1. And so that's the delta p. And here, on the right-hand side, we have p times q, the frequencies of the two alternative alleles, times w1 minus w2. w1 and w, uh, w1 and w2 are what we call the marginal fitness of these two alleles. So that's the, uh, that's the average fitness of an allele, kind of averaged across the other genotypes. And then we divide that by the average fitness. The average fitness is a weighted sum. 
It's the frequency of one allele times its fitness, or the frequency of one genotype times its fitness, plus the frequency of the other genotypes plus their fitness and so forth. It's like a, a, it's a weighted average. We need to divide by this so that we standardize allele frequencies to one. Normally, if there's no selection, we don't divide by, by W average, if there's no selection acting, right? In Hardy-Weinberg, we just have P squared plus two PQ and, and Q squared and all that business. We don't have any selection. But to, to uh, sort of standardize allele frequencies after selection, again, to fall into the range of zero, one, we need to divide by the, by the average fitness. And so conversely, for the other allele, for the, for the little a allele, we can calculate delta Q. And you know that the form is exactly the same. I again have P times Q. The only difference here is now that the order of the, these marginal fitness is inverse. This, so here we have W2 minus W1, again, divided by W average. And what you note here, that's why I'm putting this up here, is that the, the term PQ that we know from Hardy-Weinberg, two times P times Q, is the expected um, fraction of heterozygotes. And so the term PQ is familiar from this 2PQ term in the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And so note that for binomial sampling, the variance of the binomial distribution is n times p times 1 minus p, so n times p times q. So in other words, what we have here is sort of a, a measure of variance. And why is this uh, important or where, why am I saying this? I mean, you can't have any response to selection if there's no genetic variability, right? If, if there's no genetic variability, selection can't do anything, right? And there's not going to be any selection if one of these alleles is going to be fixed. I mean, there, there is going to be selection, but allele frequencies are not going to change, right? I'm only going to get change if these frequencies are non-zero, if I have some genetic variability. So this is just to say that genetic variability is the substrate for a response uh, to selection. Right. So, but now let's shift gears and talk about how we can detect molecular signatures of selection. And so one of the major goals of, of empirical evolutionary genetics is to understand to what extent selection, as opposed to neutral forces, uh, neutral forces being genetic drift, but in a way also mutation can be thought of as a non-directional neutral force, to what extent selection controls variation and evolution in DNA and protein sequences. It's, it's actually interesting that most evolutionary biologists are interested in selection adaptation. Of course, we know that there's all these other evolutionary forces, mutation, recombination, migration, genetic drift. They all interact. So even if we're really interested in selection, we cannot just think about selection. We need to consider the other forces as well. But a lot of us are really interested in selection because it explains this amazing diversity that we see out there to some extent. It explains how organisms are adapted to their environment. And so we can study this by looking at DNA protein sequences. And the methods for doing this often involve, as I've mentioned at the beginning, combining data on sequence divergence between species with data on genetic polymorphism within species. And sometimes we can also use just data from within species. Both approaches are, are, are valid. And so in the first part, I want to speak about, br relatively briefly, on how we can combine data on sequence divergence between species with data on genetic polymorphism within species. And there's a couple of tests that you probably have not heard about that we'll briefly mention. Um, so there's like, for example, um, the McDonald Kreitman test. So we have already encountered Marty Kreitman, the guy who in 1983 at the Nature paper with the ADH alleles, who did the first uh, sequencing study of genetic variation in Drosophila. There's a test named after him and his colleague MacDonald that is based on such a concept that you can use. And if that test is significant, it sort of indicates that selection might be operating. There's a similar test which uh, is called the HKA test. Um, let's see. I don't need to write that down. It's fine. Um, uh, HKA stands for Hudson, Kreitman again, and Aguade. And that's a similar test that is also based on this. And so there's like many, many such tests, but these are the most famous ones that are uh, relying on this principle to detect selection. So the simplest situation is when we have two homologous aligned DNA sequences from a pair of related species. 
it's obvious that this approach is only going to work if we apply to species that are not too distant from each other. Because if we take maybe super distant species, maybe they don't even have the same homologous gene. So we need to, to have things that are not too distantly related. Um, so sister species or things that are phylogenetically relatively close to each other, like humans and chimps, for example. And for the purpose of the discussion, we assume that all evolutionary change occurs by nucleotide substitutions. That is, that the sequence differences are caused entirely by one nucleotide base changing in another one by mutation. A T into an A, for example. And so substitutions, if we talk about, now we're not talking about two different populations, we're comparing two different species. And so what are nucleotide substitutions between species? We call that divergence. It means that like one species is completely fixed for one nucleotide at that position. Every member of that species has a T and all the other individuals from the other species I'm sampling, they have a, another nucleotide or base pair, they have an A, right? That would be a substitution because something has been substituted by something else. It's a fixed difference. It's not a polymorphism, but it's a divergent position because there's no polymorphism in either species. Everyone has a T. In the other species, everyone has an A, so it's, it's a fixed difference. It's a nucleotide substitution. So this is usually um, um, the case for coding sequences um, because insertions or deletions can uh, disrupt functionality. So let's look at divergence. So this is a little bit similar to the coalescent picture we do rested yesterday, but it's, there's a difference. When we do coalescence theory, as we've done uh, yesterday a little bit, we, we looked at uh, a similar graph upside down, right? Uh, the most recent common ancestor. And then here we didn't have species, but we had gene copies or sequences of the same gene from, from, different, from two different individuals, okay? But here, what we're doing is something similar, but now we're not comparing two individuals from within the same species, we're comparing two species, okay? And that's, that's, that's a quite a, a big difference. But the rest is somewhat similar. Again, I have some time here, back to the, to the common ancestor and here. And so the total time again, as we've discussed yesterday, we have talked about 4n mu, which is two times, 2n times mu, and I told you that 2n is an expected time. Here, again, we have a total time of 2t, right? 2 capital T, where capital T now is the divergence time. It's not the mean coalescent time uh, in this context. We call it the divergence time. The total time separating a pair of sequences in the same homologous gene from the two species is 2t, okay? So under neutral evolution, the expected number of changes or mutations, we call that K, is expected to be equal to the mutation rate times the divergence time between the two species. So we have a total time of 2T, so two branches times the divergence time times the mutations that can accumulate on either branch. I can have mutations accumulating on that branch or on that branch that lead to fixed differences between the two species. And I need to multiply that mutation rate by the total amount of time, which is two capital T, right? And note that this form is very similar. So now um, maybe I'm gonna go quickly to the, to the blackboard. I mean, so K, which is, is two times mu times t. This has a very similar form um, to zeta. Which is two, for a diploid, two times two n times mu, right? So I have a factor two upstairs here and downstairs. I have mu and then I have here capital T, which is the divergence time, and here I have 2n, which is the mean coalescent time. But at, at, at an abstract level, I mean the two things are kind of like very similar structurally, right? They're sort of equivalent. So I have time, times here in both cases. I have the mutation rate and I have 
two lineages that I'm looking at, right? Did you talk about uh, fixation probabilities? So what's the fixation probability of a neutral allele? Right. Um, so, well, maybe just as a brief detour, the frequency of the A allele is the number of individuals that carry the A allele divided by the total number, right? That would be the frequency, and we know from what you guys have learned that the fixation probability for a neutral allele corresponds to its initial frequency, right? Now, for a new mutation, if you imagine that everyone is capital A at the beginning in the population at this nucleotide position and then a mutation happens. The mutation means that like one individual, because mutations are rare, it's reasonable to assume that the mutation at first only occurs in a single individual, right? So then we have this mutant individual where a capital A got turned into a little a. So the initial frequency here of that thing is going to be what? 1 over 2n, right? 1 over 2n, exactly. So this is, this is just like the generic formula, but if we think about an initial de novo neutral mutation, it's going to be 1 over 2n, and that's the fixation probability, right, for a neutral allele, fixed prop. Um, and so an interesting way of seeing this is maybe you have seen these graphs. I actually have a slide somewhere, but we can do this on the, on the whiteboard or on the, what? Well, not on the green board, pardon me. Not the whiteboard. So here we have, um, Here we have the frequency of A, and here we have time. And we can, do, um, we can look at sit situations of genetic drift where we imagine a bunch of replicate populations in the computer, in the real world. And at the beginning, they're all the same. At the beginning, they have a 50-50 frequency of capital A over little a, right? So everyone starts out here, right? And then we just let them drift. So population one is going to drift like this, wiggle around, and then shoop, it's going to hit. It's going to hit 100%. It's going to become fixed. Another replicate population might wiggle around and wiggle around, wiggle around, go up and do this, wiggle around and continue wiggling. A third one that also starts out here will wiggle around and up and down, and then bloop, go down to zero, right? And so at the end. If I do this many, many times, always starting the same way and looking at genetic drift, what will I find? I will find that the allele frequencies will have diverged. So let's say I have 20 populations that I, I look at here, right? It will be 20. About half of them, if I wait long enough, about half of them will be fixed and about half of them will have lost the allele. And the interesting thing about this is Things wiggle around. Here they start all at 0.5. What, what is the situation here? The variance has increased over time, right? Like some will have fixed the A allele, others will have fixed the little A allele. But on average, on average, and that's where the expectation comes in, here at the end, in the long run, it's still going to be 0.5 over the ensemble, okay? And so that's also why the initial allele frequency corresponds to the fixation probability under drift, right? And we can start anywhere we want. With selection, of course, the fixation probability is going to be biased. If I have a positively selected allele, if A is beneficial, I expect more of them to fix, right? 
and not to fix the alternative allele. And why am I saying this? Because here we talked about, um, we talked about uh, the number of, of fixed differences between the two species, which is like these two lineages times mu times t. I, and why I'm doing this is because I want to show you a different way of thinking about uh, this mu and connecting it to, to theta. Um, so what is the expected number of substitutions? So if I have, here's the common ancestor and here I have species one and species two. What is the expected number of substitutions considering only one branch? What do you think? 2n mu, right? 2n mu, just considering one branch. That's correct. Now, what's the fixation probability under neutrality? 1 over 2n. So to get the complete number, it's 2n mu times 1 over 2n, right? Which is mu. Exactly. So the expected number of substitutions is actually the mutation rate itself, right? And so the 2n and the 1 over 2n cancel out. So this is a different way of thinking about this because if we would write the whole thing, it would be what? I'm not sure this is going to be useful, but anyways, 2n mu times 1 over 2n times t, right? And these things cancel out. So there's like, just like a different way of thinking about the same thing. So there's actually something a little bit hidden in here, in, in this mu. Of course, we can think of it just as the mutation rate. That's accurate. But if we unpack it a little bit, we see, if you write it this way, that it contains the fixation probability. Because here, in contrast to coalescent theory, where we talk about polymorphisms, we talk about nucleotide substitution, so fixed differences between species. We, we're not only saying that mutations need to accumulate to make the two things polymorphic. We're saying like, okay, there needs to be a fixed difference. And so that's why the fixation probability comes in. But for selected alleles, of course, the fixation probability is going to be different. Okay, so let's go back. <laughs> right. Yes. So we've just looked at this. So the simplest way to understand this is to note that under neutral evolution, the expected number of mutations that distinguish a pair of sequences is equal to the time separating them, so which is 2 times t, times the rate of mutation per unit time. That's what we've just said. And so what we want to do now is um, we want to compare k values, which are like numbers of uh, substitutions as a measure of divergence, we want to compare values for different nucleotide sites. Because different sites in the genome carry different sorts of information. So we want to do that for nucleotide sites where mutations can be reasonably assumed to be neutral or nearly neutral. And then we want to do the same exercise for sites in the genome that are presumably less likely to be neutral. Or where we wish to test for selection. And so larger than neutral k values would indicate directional selection, positive selection. And smaller than neutral k values would indicate purifying selection. But if the two, for the two sites, the k values are the same, then we're probably in a situation where we have neutrality. Okay? And so what do we use? as candidates for selection, for selected sites. If we look at coding sequences in proteins, we're looking at non-synonymous sites. So these are those that will change the codon and the amino acid identity, and therefore, in many cases, the function, functionality of the protein. These are the non-synonymous sites, right? And so these are often thought to be under selection. And what do we use as the presumably neutral sites, the synonymous sites, right? Because the, at the synonymous sites, it does not matter whether I change my, my triplet, my, my codon, 
uh, if I change the amino acid, I'm still going to get the, I'm still going to get, sorry, I'm gonna still going to get the same amino acid if I change the nucleotide in my codon. And so therefore the protein sequence is not going to be affected at the, by a change at the synonymous site, right? And so that's therefore why we often use them as neutral sites. Um, so this comes from the fact that K and Zeta for non-synonymous variants are nearly always much smaller than for synonymous and non-coding sites. So this is an interesting fact that is summarized here uh, in a slightly, or written here in a slightly abstract way. What it says is that um, you have usually less divergence or um, genetic variability for non-synonymous variants than for synonymous or non-coding sites. Because often non-synonymous changes will change the protein function and in most cases this is bad. That's why you often see more synonymous changes than non-synonymous changes. I mean non-synonymous changes can potentially be good but we already know that beneficial mutations are extremely unlikely. So most non-synonymous changes are deleterious and so that's why we often see many more synonymous than non-synonymous changes, okay? And so that already is an indication, this fact is already an indication that purifying selection might be very pervasive, right, in the genome. And so there's a way with, with which we can sort of formally look at that, which is known as the K A to KS ratio. Sometimes it's also called this ratio omega, or more commonly, I think this is actually more common than KA, KS, DNDS. Sometimes it's also capital D. But DNDS you will see quite often. So here on this slide it's called KAKS, but it doesn't matter. This ratio is used to estimate the balance between neutral mutations, purifying selection, and beneficial mutations that act on a set of homologous protein coding genes. You can only use this really intelligently for protein coding sequences, where we can distinguish between synonymous and non-synonymous sites. So it's simply the ratio of the number of non-synonymous substitutions per non-synonymous site, Ka, in a given period of time to the number of synonymous substitutions per synonymous site, Ks, in the same period. And as we've said before, we often assume synonymous changes to be neutral so that the ratio indicates the net balance between deleterious and beneficial mutations. That's, that's the idea. So. Um, let me see, um, Ka over Ks, or I, I actually like better Dn over Ds, is a ratio and what we're saying is that under neutrality we expect this to be the same. But we might also have a situation where we have more synonymous than non-synonymous uh, changes. And in that case, the numerator is going to be smaller than the denominator. And in that case, we're going to get something that's smaller than one, right? And that would be the case of purifying selection. We see more synonymous changes than non-synonymous ones, presumably because all the non-synonymous changes are selected against. They're all bad. That's why this is going to be smaller than one. Conversely, we might see that this ratio is bigger than one, which means that we have more non-synonymous changes, a bigger numerator than synonymous changes in the denominator, making that ratio bigger than one. And that might be a good indication that there is positive selection. Knowing that most non-synonymous changes are deleterious, if we see a surplus of them, this might, doesn't prove, but might lead us to believe that selection has actually done something uh, positive, right, and favored these uh, non-synonymous changes. And then this ratio would be one. That's sort of the, the, the logic of the, of the test. So a ratio greater than one implies positive selection, a ratio less than one implies purifying selection. By contrast, a ratio of exactly one indicates sort of neutrality or no selection. So here is a simple example from an empirical study of how this looks like. I mean, like these tables always look boring, it's just like number crunching, 
Um, but it's, it's just statistics, right? But, but you've got to be excited by the answer. Is there selection or not? <laughs> and so this is an example from two uh, closely related Drosophila species, um, Drosophila miranda and uh, Pseudo obscura. Uh, and so th here they calculated statistics on diversity and divergence. So we have pi, we have zeta. Here we have uh, divergence at synonymous, uh, at non-synonymous and at synonymous sites, so Ka and Ks. And the one and the two here mean the two different species, right? For the divergence values, there's obviously no one and two because we're like looking at the divergence between the species. But these statistics here, zeta and uh, uh, pi, of course, we calculate for each species separately. And so here for Miranda, they looked at 18 loci and for Pseudo Obscura, they looked at 14 loci in the genome. And these species diverged from each other about 2 million years ago. And all these values are percentages. So what do we see here for Ka to Ks? So the best estimate here for Ka is 2.48 and here it's 22.2. And that's a very low Ka to Ks ratio. Actually, when we do the mass, it's like 12% or 12.8%, so let's say 13%. And that suggests that there's potentially, it's again not a proof, it's just statistics. It means that there's potentially very strong purifying selection. Yes, please. <laughs> uh, how do we know that the species diverged from uh, two million years ago. Two million years ago, because I, I thought that we saw we, we the, the difference in the sequence to estimate the, the time, but right. if the sequence can be biased by selection, how right, do we know? right. So I'm not totally sure in this case where that number comes from. I would need to see. Uh, they have probably estimated this using neutral sites. Because if you do it, as you say, using selected sites, you're going to get a bias. So if you can be reasonably be sure that we, there's some neutral sites in the genome, then you can maybe use them to date this. But you would also, of course, need to have knowledge of the mutation rate. And sometimes, of course, people don't know exactly the mutation rate in these organisms. So maybe, I'm not totally sure, maybe they have taken the mutation rate estimates from Drosophila melanogaster, where this has been measured empirically. That's also why yesterday you, you remember that I said like these numbers are numbers, but they're qualitative numbers. It's like not like in theoretical physics where we can be so precise. So they're rough estimates because sometimes when we do these calculations, we make some assumptions and sometimes they're a little bit hidden. So it's a good question. I'm not totally sure where that comes from, but it's probably a reasonable estimate. Thank you. Right, so here, it looks like there's like many more synonymous than uh, uh, non-synonymous changes, and so that uh, suggests that there's purifying selection. Here is another example. This is from introns. Introns are the things that get spliced out, right? They don't make it into the mRNA, into the protein. So we have introns and exons. And actually, a lot of people use short introns. This gets back again to your question. If, if I wanted to find sites in the genome that I can use as a neutral reference, what do we choose? Because like in many organisms, the, the, the whole genome is sometimes under some form of selection. And is there anything ever that is really neutral? I mean, this is not so, so easy to find, but pretty good candidates, people believe, are short introns. And so this is also illustrated here. So here we look at divergence on the y-axis between melanogaster and simulans. These are two sister sibling species. They're actually incredibly hard to distinguish, even phenotypically. Um, you can do it by looking at their genitals under the microscope, essentially. But they're really hard to distinguish. And, and so they're very similar and closely related. And here is the divergence for these intronic sites as a function of the length of the intron expressed in base pairs. And so what we see here is that for short introns, there's like a lot of spread here in terms of the divergence. But out here for the long introns, there is uh, actually not much spread, right? Like it's, and it's very low divergence, right? So the variance is small in, in along the y-axis. And we're like uh, converging to a very low level of, of divergence. And that's a very interesting pattern. What this suggests is that the short introns here, 100 base pairs or shorter, 
they're like evolving probably quite freely. It really doesn't really matter much. And you can have a lot of divergence because you don't give a crap, right? I mean, these things are probably neutral. But here, the long introns, they might be somehow functionally important. And so that's why you have very low divergence between the species. So the fact that long introns evolve more slowly than average implies that while the majority of introns in the Drosophila genome may experience little or no selective constraint, most intronic DNA in the genome is likely to be evolving under considerable constraint, like here. And so short introns seem to be under less constraint and might therefore be a good candidate for neutral sites. So in my own studies, when we want to infer selection, we often use randomly picked short intronic sites around the genome as a sort of a neutral background or, or reference in, in many studies. And there's other sites in the genome, like um, <clears throat> so-called uh, fourfold degenerate sites and, and, and other sites that people often use uh, as, as, as uh, neutral uh, sites. But so if we think about the effects of deleterious mutations on fitness, there, it's clear that there's many deleterious mutations that enter the population in each generation, but most of them will be eliminated by selection. If they haven't been lost by drift, they will eventually be eliminated by selection. They, they're not gonna be kicking around for a long time. And so the mean, while the mean level of variability is much lower, for non-synonymous than for synonymous mutations, this probably simply means that all the deleterious ones have been rapidly removed by selection. And so that uh, amino acid variants that we see to be segregating now, the variation that is still around is selectively neutral. And so at least it should be our baseline hypothesis. So what happens if you have a very good beneficial mutation or allele. What is your expectation? What should happen in the long run? It should become fixed. It first needs to survive drift. That's a big obstacle. But if it survives the stochastic phase and picks up in frequency so that selection can see it, it should become fixed. We don't see it anymore. If something super bad happens, then that thing should disappear. So the variability that we see, the, 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 the most logical hypothesis for that variability is that most of the sequence variability we see might be effectively neutral. But someone asked me this on the first day, I think, um, in the break. We often classify things into neutral, nearly neutral, weakly deleterious, strongly deleterious, lethal, mildly beneficial or strongly beneficial and so forth in this distribution of fitness effects. It's a distribution, but, but these categories neutral, deleterious, beneficial, are sort of artificial because I think in reality things might be more complex. So it could be that we have a neutral variant that floats around in our genome. Some of us have this allele, other people have that allele, but it doesn't matter. This thing is just drifting around, fluctuating stochastically in frequency. But then imagine that the environment changes. It could now be that one of these alleles now has a, an advantage. So this neutrality, or whether something is deleterious or beneficial, often depends on the context. So it's wrong, I, I would say. I mean, sometimes it might be true, but it's probably often wrong to think, ah, this is just a beneficial mutation, full stop. Well, it, it might be beneficial here and now, but in a different context, it could perhaps be neutral or even deleterious. So that's, that's something I wanted to mention. So it's a topic of current research uh, to try and estimate the distribution of the selection coefficients, uh, little s, for deleterious amino acid and silent variants in natural populations. So it's still an empirical thing that people try to estimate these coefficients and look at the distribution. And estimates for amino acid variants indicate a very wide distribution of fitness effects, such that the mean selection coefficient against the heterozygous non-synonymous variant is on the order of s 10 to the minus 5. Sometimes, I mean, you can think of these as percentages. Um, sometimes, uh, in, in rare situations, S can also be much higher. Uh, Haldane, for example, in an example that I'm going to show later of a, of a moth, found uh, a selection coefficient of 30%, 0.3. But this is a more complex allele, so this is per nucleotide here. 
But you see here selection is not, is not very strong on a, on a single nucleotide change or a single amino acid variant in this case. And values for synonymous or silent variants are much smaller. So one order of magnitude smaller, one in a million. S is here 10 to the minus 6. And so again, together this sort of indicates that purifying selection against non-synonymous changes is pervasive. So here is an example of positive directional selection. Again, uh, looking at divergence. And so here they looked at coding and non-coding sequences. And so they found in that study faster divergence in the coding than in the non-coding sequences. So what did they look at? They looked at the, a gene that is called uh, ODSH, and it's a homeobox gene. Do you all know what the homeobox gene is? No? Uh, homeobox genes are, are genes that are developmentally super important and they have a, um, a stretch of 180 base pairs, the so-called homeobox, that is very specific. This homeobox part of the gene determines in the protein, in the corresponding protein, what's called the homeodomain. The homeobox is 180 base pairs long, the homeodomain in the protein is like 60 amino acids long. And this is the part of the protein that will recognize the DNA because like these homeobox genes are transcription factors and they need to recognize the transcript or the gene that they want to regulate, that they're supposed to regulate, and the homeodomain mediates that binding or that specificity. And so they are developmentally super important. And so here they looked at the homeodomain, which is the functionally important domain of the proteins encoded by these genes, and then there's a non-homeodomain -homeo part of these things, and then there might be introns. And so in these homeobox genes, they looked at the divergence, and they found that divergence here between melanogaster and simulans, here between melanogaster and the third species that is closely related, Drosophila mauritiana, and here between simulans and mauritiana, that the divergence in the homeodomain was much higher than in the non-homeodomain parts. And the non-homeodomain parts are arguably functionally less important, and the introns surely are functionally less important than the homeodomain. And they had here evidence for accelerated evolution in the homeodomain part, and that's sort of an indication that positive selection might have happened. So here in the abstract of the science paper, they write that in the past half million years, this homeodomain has experienced more amino acid substitutions than it did in the preceding 700 million years. And during this period, it has also evolved faster than other parts of the protein, for example, the non-homeodomain parts, or even the introns. Such rapid sequence divergence is driven by positive selection and might contribute to reproductive isolation between these closely related species. So again, this is no proof, but it's very strong evidence just from looking at sequencing data the positive selection has driven that difference. That doesn't tell us why and how it exactly happened and what the phenotypic relevance of this is, right? But it's an indication that positive selection has been operating. Right, so now we come to this test that I've mentioned, the mcdonald Creighton test. And so this is a test that compares, um, formally compares non-synonymous and synonymous site divergence between species to non-synonymous and synonymous site diversity or polymorphism within species. So we're comparing divergence versus polymorphism using the same gene. And so the assumption is if variants at both kinds of sites are neutral, the numbers of substitutions at the two kinds of sites between the two species should be in the same ratio as the polymorphism within either species if we assume an equilibrium between drift and mutation. So maybe we can just write that down. So in fact, um, so now we're not just looking at DNDS which was just uh, a measure of divergence at synonymous and non-synonymous sites. Now we're looking at divergence and polymorphism. And so sometimes people define something like what we could call a neutrality index. We can call it NI, 
So what is Ni? It's a ratio of ratios. And so upstairs, we have Pn divided by Ps. And here we have Dn divided by Ds. So upstairs here, we have the ratio of the polymorphisms non-synonymous to synonymous polymorphism divided by um, non-synonymous divergence to synonymous divergence. And the idea is similar. If this thing here is one, then we think it's, there's neutrality. Um, if, it's, if it's greater than one, then we think there's negative selection. And if it's smaller than one, we think that there's positive selection. So the logic is somewhat similar. And so um, this is a test that uses both these sort of data. So let's go back to the slides. Thank you. And so here I, I put again down these formulae or equations that we had talked about previously. We can think about neutral divergence and we can think about neutral diversity. And this mcdonald kreitman test is using both types of information, right? So this we already talked about. Where does the 4n mu come from? We don't need to do that. And so here again, if the ratio of non-synonymous variance to synonymous variance for differences between species is greater than the ratio for within species variation, this would suggest positive directional selection. This would be if this ratio is smaller than one. So if this part, right, is, is bigger than, uh, than the numerator, then we have positive selection. So that's the statement of, uh, that's here. If the opposite is the case, we probably have purifying selection. And so here is an example where people have done this. This is again from, from flies. So here they looked at some uh, proteins in the centromeres, which are um, histone uh, proteins. And so here there's a sequence alignment of different species. That doesn't really matter. The more interesting thing is here, um, where they looked at uh, divergence between melanogaster and simulans, which are these closely related species. So here on the y-axis, you have either pi, which is a measure of polymorphism, right, that we've talked about yesterday, or you have k, which is divergence. And the black solid line is divergence between the species. And pi within simulans, within only one species, is down here. And you see here in the N-terminal tail region of the, of the gene, where we have mostly non-synonymous changes, we see a big spike in divergence. And so if we do the statistics on this, we get a significant mcdonald kreitman test. So this is what is shown here. So essentially what you do is a, a two by two table, a two by two contingency table that you all know from statistics. And you compare these ratios. I'm comparing the fixed differences, which is divergence. I get a ratio of eight to four, but for the polymorphic sites, I'm going to get zero to nine. And if I do the stats on this, I find that this is a highly significant uh, test result. And so there's evidence for adaptive evolution, positive selection driving this difference. Yeah. So using data on many different genes, uh, people have also developed, yes, please. Uh. Well, I, I don't know the literature on the subject, but uh, is there a, when, I don't know if these, these tests specifically are uh, very used nowadays, but when people do this kind of tests, because this one and the other one you show, they are very similar in the sense that if you have this one yeah. ratio, uh -huh. then it's neutral, and if it's more or less, right. then, right. and uh, I don't know, for me it seems there, there is a, a uh, ju just think like r randomly, there is a, a higher chance that's not going to be one. And even if you do like the statistics and try mm -hmm. to see a standard yes. error, yes. is there a chance that's going to be like, uh, okay, the standard error does not overlap with one, but it's very, very next to one uh, Absolutely. in uh, either side. So do people discuss like the effect size of these uh, things? Because as I think that there must be a difference when you have a very small number yes. and one that looks pretty close to one, but is not one. Right, absolutely. Yeah, so, so I think that's uh, really, uh, as, as, you, um, as you're mentioning, uh, can be a worry, 
because the, the, the test might be statistically significant, but as we know, we can get false positive tests. I mean, it might be a lot of crap, and the effect size might be small, and is it then gonna be biologically meaningful? So these tests are, one thing I would say, are only as good as the data that you put in and the assumptions you make. But I think more generally, uh, and this is something we will see hopefully towards the end of this lecture, I think it's a really good idea to use several tests. I mean, maybe not the NDS and then McDonald Crichton because like it's so similar, right? So I would say this test has the advantage that it's using both divergence and polymorphism data. On the other hand, the drawback of this test is that you need to have divergence data, which sometimes you can't get for your species. You don't know what the closer related species is or the genome is not available. So sometimes you're stuck with polymorphism data. But in principle, I think this is good that it using, uses both types of information. But so this is like one of the, the key messages I wanna kind of like uh, drive home during this week that like we can do all these tests and population genetic theory is beautiful and statistics too. But again, at the end of the day, to be really sure, it's maybe good to sort of have different independent tests and maybe also experimental evidence, right? Um, because I mean, yeah, so I mean, I, I believe these stories here, like, um, oops, I'm, I'm going the wrong direction, huh? Yeah, I believe that this might have to do with positive selection, but like, I still don't understand in terms of biology, why and how and what does it do molecularly and does it affect the phenotype and why did this divergence originate? So as a scientist, it makes me um, leave wanting for more rather than just believing, oh, there's positive selection, I'm like done because my test tells me that. that that's kind of like the answer I would give. Um, I, I take these tests as a hint, but as a skeptic, I'm not going to be fully convinced that, you know, we always have to be very skeptical, I think. You have to. I was going back and forth, and forth thinking I understood and then uh, didn't understand uh, the, the, what are then well, the test, the Mac, Mac mm -hmm. what is the name? McDonald uh, Crichton yes. test. Yes. Can you can you go through the explanation of why uh, one uh, this ratio is uh, is negative or positive? You expect uh, either different. I I kind of understand the null hypothesis, yes. which would be. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so I think the logic is a little bit like this, right? If if I have a um, most non-synonymous variants, that's what the N stands for, right? are gonna be deleterious, right? They're gonna be bad. It's very rare that they're positively selected, let's say, right? And, and so in the long run, they're not gonna make it, right? I mean, they're not gonna to contribute to the divergence between species. I mean, they're gonna, they're gonna disappear, right? Let's say I have a capital A versus a little a at this site, and the little a is negative. And it's very unlikely that one species will have fixed the negative non-synonymous change and the other one the positive one, right? I mean, if it's strongly deleterious. Does that make sense? So if it's a negative, a strongly deleterious allele, we don't expect it to contribute to the, the, to the divergence, to that fixed substitution between the species, right? And if that's the case, we might still see the negative thing floating around at the level of polymorphism within a species. It hasn't been eliminated yet, let's say. But here, at the level of species divergence, we wouldn't see it anymore. And if that's the case, then we would be in the case of, of negative selection, and then this ratio would be bigger than one. Because here, we would still see that it contributes to polymorphism, but not at the level of divergence. Yeah. I mean, this is more or less the the explanation, similar for positive, se for, for positive selection. So if we see, if we see a non-synonymous site, I mean, we know that most of them are deleterious, but like sometimes non-synonymous can be positive. If we see a non-synonymous site um, fixed between two different species, it's quite likely that this thing was not a bad thing, right? If, if, that, if that substitution or that polymorphism initially was really bad, right, as, as we've just said before, then it shouldn't have become fixed in one versus the other species. So if I see a substitution at a non-synonymous site, chances are that it was positive, and that's why it fixed or, or 
contributed to this divergence between the species. And so that would contribute to a higher DNDS ratio. And that would make the, um, the denominator bigger than the numerator. And then we would like be in the, in the case where that thing will be smaller than one. And we see more, we see an excess of non-synonymous divergent sites as compared to polymorphism. And that would be sort of taken as an indication that positive selection might have been acted. So that's sort of the logic. But I agree with you again. <laughs> it's, it's not so intuitive. And it may, it may not always be true. And uh, it makes assumptions, right? One of the things you, you said uh, is that uh, even the speciation process is mm -hmm. much driven by neutrality. So, Absolutely. So, uh, oh, yes. and, and, that, and that test gives mm -hmm. neutrality only one value, while it gives uh, s selection infinite one. So, so you need to get a, for, for you to say. Oh, maybe not infinite, but uh, no, I mean, yes. so one is just like the expectation is that, like if things are neutral, we would expect uh, divergence and polymorphism to be the same. On that. Because like it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, you, you're not going to get a differential pattern within species as compared between species for neutral sites. So that's why, on average, should be one, right? Yes. For the things that don't matter, they don't show a bias in one or either direction, right? I mean, I, I just mean that uh, for because this is going to be sorry, this is going to be approximately one, and this is going to be approximately one. Yes, it's just that. As I would expect neutrality to be a, a, a great force, I, I think a test would have a, a range of values, uh, we, uh, on on which the you you'd, you'd interpret the the ratio you calculated as as neutrality. But in that case, uh, you you would have to to do something like oh it's very close to one, so I'll <laughs> interpret yes, as yes. neutrality. Oh, it's too far away from one. And, and now I'm just going to repeat what I said okay, about sorry. the numbers being qualitative. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, but it's, I think it's a very good point. I mean, exactly. So we can't be sure from this alone. I mean, uh, so, okay, if we're, if, if, we're, if we're cool about it, we can say, ah, oh, it's pretty cool what we can like do theoretically and with stats and what we can infer. But if we're a little bit more skeptical like you and me or a little bit more cynical about it, we can also say, it's an amazing, how many limitations we have. What am I going to do if the answer is, I don't know, 0.98? Could there be a little bit evidence for selection? Or is this, is, or is this neutral? Uh, is it, it, does it significantly deviate from neutrality depending on the sample sizes and so forth, right? So that's, that's the problem, right? But that's always the problem with statistics. So I'm sorry that I cannot give a very satisfactory answer. Um, I think like to assume that under neutrality this is sort of one is sort of reasonable but but I agree with you there's like lots of caveats uh, about these uh, methods so let's go let's see where are we Thomas yes uh, we've been only checking negative purifying uh, and purifying neutral and uh, directional selection right. can we check balancing selection um, so we will talk about balancing selection um, in, in that section. So there are some uh, signatures of balancing selection um, that we can use, for example, only looking at polymorphism data. And so in the, in the next section of the lecture, we're going to mainly talk about what happens within species. And so yesterday on the Monday, we talked all about pi, this nucleotide variability, right, which like in flies we said is like, 0.2, maybe. And we can look, and so we do that in real world data, we can sort of estimate pi along the, the sequence. And so what I'm gonna just explain next is that sometimes in the, in the sequence we see that it wiggles around, around 0.02 maybe, and then sometimes we see a really localized dip in pi where variability is greatly reduced and this can be an indication, for example, for positive selection. 
for positive directional selection, as I will explain. But for balancing selection, sometimes we see sort of the opposite. So pi wiggles around, whatever, there's some noise. And then we see some localized peak in pi, where there's much higher nucleotide variability at a given uh, position than we would see in the rest of the genome. And this can, in principle, be an indication that there's balancing selection, that there's higher than normal variability being maintained. Then you are going to need to see the temporal differences. You can only infer only by the neutrality indexes. No, I mean, you, we wouldn't use this, right? But we would just like sort of look at this or use another statistic I'm going to introduce, which is called Tachimas D. And, and so we can, and there's some other tests, but yeah, so if we see excess variability as compared to background or normal levels, um, then, then there might be an indication that it could be balancing selection. Yeah. Cool, right. So I think let's take uh, maybe a five minute break and then we'll continue. We're probably not going to be able to finish, but that's okay. At 10.45? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But so we go till 11, don't we? No, yeah. no. Oh, until 10.45. Okay, sure. Okay, so let's carry on. <laughs> okay, so let's look at patterns within populations. And so this is connected to the subject of selective sweeps that you've talked about with uh, Sean. And so selective sweeps are all about indirect evidence for selection because when we have a selective sweep, the patterns of nucleotide variability at neighboring positions are going to be affected by the sweep. So after an advantageous mutation has spread, or we say swept through a population, the level of polymorphism, like here, will be reduced across that region. And so this even occur, I mean, this occurs at, at sites that are linked, statistically associated or physically linked to the site that is undergoing the sweep. And these sites, the neighboring sites, might be completely neutral. They're not beneficial, but they get dragged along with the beneficial site. This is because a unique selectively favorable mutation may arise at a site in a DNA sequence that is completely linked to a polymorphic neutral locus, right? The neighboring locus might, or variant, uh, might, by, might be, you know, uh, not doing anything, but it's linked to this selectively favorable site. And so this effect is called the hitchhiking effect. This is a specific term for selective sweeps, which was uh, developed by these two gentlemen, uh, John Maynard Smith, one of the most famous evolutionary biologists in the last 100 years. And uh, then the, the, the term selective sweep was coined by, uh, by Barry et al. in 91. And this is a case of what we call linked selection. So we are looking at selection but we need, we need to take into account what happens at neighboring sites that are linked to the selected site. The selected site could be negatively selected. That's another form of linked selection. We call that often background selection. You might have a negative mutation and it has neighboring sites that are neutral and the fate of the neutral variants that are linked to the, to the deleterious allele, they're also going to be affected um, by selection on the deleterious allele. So here is a, a figure or a sketch of how a selective sweep looks like. A selective sweep fixes variants that are linked to the selected site. And so this is a form of hitchhiking. So let's consider here a bunch of sequences. The white balls represent SNPs, neutral SNPs. One individual here had a positive beneficial mutation, right? That's the black ball. This here arose as a de novo mutation in one individual, and now it happens to be linked or statistically associated with this neutral variant and with this one. This sequence here is what we call a haplotype. At the beginning, this is the amount of variability we had. We could calculate nucleotide variability here using these sequences by calculating pi. Look at what happened after selection. After selection, everyone has the beneficial allele, but the pattern at the neighboring site looks exactly the same for all these sequences, and it looks identical to that haplotype, right? 
because all these sites that were there in neutral, I mean, they're linked. They're in linkage that's equilibrium, we say. And they were dragged along by this one positive variant and then spread through the mutation, uh, through the population, right? So as the, the advantageous variant increases in frequency, it causes low diversity at the closely linked sites. So here, if I look here at the beginning, there's variability here. This guy, this haplotype has this variant, but this guy has a different variant and so forth. There's variability. But here I don't have any variability anymore. And that's what I mean if we would calculate pi in such, uh, um, in such a way along the genome and we see this localized reduction in pi, this might reflect such a situation here, right? Where something that it was good got fixed and dragged down locally, um, dragged with it uh, these neutral alleles so that I, I don't have variability anymore. But the, the, the more I walk away from these sites, the more variability I might see again. I might be back up here, back up here, because linkage, this equilibrium or linkage decays as a function of distance. You all know what linkage, this equilibrium is? Who knows what LD is? Yeah? How would you define it? Well, if I remember correctly, is when uh, you have uh, haplotypes, you have two, two loci, for example, uh -huh. and uh, the frequency that these two loci appear together yeah. in the genome, it's much higher than you would expect. Uh, so you Yes, so you see a specific combination of loci. Absolutely, that's a perfect definition. It's a statistical correlation of the frequency of alleles at different sites. This can come about by physical linkage because things are very close together physically. That will also cause statistical, what we call linkage disequilibrium. But in principle, you could even have LD between sites on two different chromosomes. This might not be very common because like, they segregate independently. But in principle, if you have very, very strong correlational selection, it could even lead to a situation where things are physically very distant, but it's always good to have an A here at this position in the genome and another variant at this other gene somewhere else, and they might be kept together. So there can be long range disequilibrium. But normally when we walk across the genome, LD decays pretty quickly because there's recombination. And recombination probability increases as the distance between two sites increases. And so in Drosophila, LD decays to about 50% within a few hundred base pairs, let's say, to 50%, and then gets close to zero if we even walk further away from the site. So if I see strong LD, uh, especially um, and, and the pattern like that, there might be an indication that the selective sweep has happened. So we, that really means that there's information in Pi or Zeta Watterson and, and Pi or Zeta Watterson would be reduced in such a situation. And so such an effect in terms of reduced variability can be detectable if the time since the selective substitution is sufficiently small. I mean, if we try to look too much backward in time, recombination events might have happened and so forth that like obscure the pattern. So this is another uh, way of showing this. Uh, I think we can skip over this. And here is a simulation. This is a computer simulation of exactly that thing here that we showed with the reduction pi. So here on the y-axis, we have average heterozygosity or pi uh, along a recombining chromosome under a mathematical model of genetic hitchhiking, making a bunch of assumptions here for the recombination rate, for the population size, for zeta and so forth. And so this is a computer simulation and essentially what you get is exactly this thing here with a very localized drop in, in nucleotide diversity where here they assume that directional selection happens at exactly that position. So this I'm also going to skip over. This is to illustrate that if we have here the green balls are the, are the selected variants that have dragged along this gray neutral variant and here's a weakly deleterious variant that is not strongly selected against. So we see a reduction in variability. This plot here is like a linkage disequilibrium plot. I don't want to go into details but the red color codes here mean that there's very strong LD between these things. That means if I have this 
beneficial variant, I always have that neutral variant. There's a statistical correlation and that can be quantified. So if I see a drop in variability together with the increase in linkage to equilibrium, then it means probably that there might have been a selective sweep. There's also other ways of how we can look at this by looking at what is called the side frequency spectrum, which is up here. Um, and I don't know, did you talk with Sean about the side frequency spectrum or? Not really, no. Yeah. Okay. So this is just like the distribution of different uh, variants. So it's like physicists know what the frequency spectrum is. It's like, it's the frequency distribution of the frequencies. So let's say I have many alleles in a genome and different alleles have different frequencies. There, there are some rare alleles that have a frequency of 5% or lower. Some alleles have a frequency of 10%. Some alleles have a frequency of 50, 60, 70, 80, 90%. I can make frequency bins for the alleles and I can plot the frequency distribution of the frequency classes. This is what is called an allele frequency spectrum or side frequency spectrum. And we can calculate from coalescent theory, for example, we can derive how it looks like under neutrality. This is the gray frequency spectrum. These are singletons. These are mutations that only happen in one individual. And then we have doubletons and tripletons and quadrupletons and so forth. And so here we have the different frequency classes. And what you see here is that the singletons are the most frequent class. So these are rare variants, right? The rare variants, the unique variants, are the most frequent class. This makes sense because mutation is rare. And, but if we have a selective sweep, this is going to distort the neutral allele or side frequency spectrum. If we have a selective sweep, we see even more of this stuff. And from comparing, uh, looking at side frequency spectra, we can um, also infer selection. But I won't have time to go into the details here. So what we've looked at here, or what we've just discussed, is what is called a hard sweep. Here is again this variability pattern, right? How it looks like. So here one beneficial mutation that's linked and this is going to drag along all the rest. Here, why is this neutral orange stuff around the selected side not the same everywhere on these sequences? Because recombination is going to eat the way at the thing and other things might happen. But you still see here very closely linked to the beneficial side we have the same stuff. And so the pattern would like look like this. But there's also other patterns of selection that are less clear. For example, soft sweeps that I will describe next, where we might also expect a pattern like this with a drop in variability, but it's much less pronounced like this uh, as compared to, the, to this uh, situation. Or we might also have what some people call partial sweeps or polygenic selection or adaptation. Polygenic may meaning involving many genes simultaneously. And here, this is really hard. So this is like both in theory. So there's like theoretical physicists, mathematicians, population geneticists working on this theoretically and empirically, namely the question, how do we best model polygenic adaptation and how can we best infer it and measure it in genomes? So they're developing theory because like here the signature is going to be very difficult to see. This is trivial, you know, almost. This is already harder. But if I have polygenic adaptation, this is very hard. And this happens often. So for example, in my lab, I'm going to show you probably on Friday an example of an experimental evolution or selection experiment for, a com for complex traits. There in the genome, we see changes at, at, at many, many loci simultaneously. And so I can't use selective sweep signatures to diagnose whether selection is happening. But this is also really hard. So the signatures are much less clear. And for background selection, if something is, uh, um, if there's selection against uh, deleterious mutations, the pattern will look like this. So these are all forms of uh, linked selection. But this one, uh, selective sweeps is the easiest to diagnose. So what is the difference now between a hard and a soft sweep? A hard sweep is, the best way to think about this is it's a de novo mutation that is beneficial, that arises, survives drift, and then spreads to fixation due to selection. And under this model, as we have seen, neutral variation here to the favorite site hitchhikes along with the favorite allele, and this leads to this localized reduction. But what is a soft sweep? 
for soft sweeps, there's two different scenarios that we can think about. And they're different from the hard sweep model. So for example, it could be that an allele that is potentially beneficial is already floating around in the population at some frequency. It might be sort of conditionally neutral, not doing much, but then the environment changes, it's already there, and selection will favor it. So it, we call this standing genetic variation. It's wrong to think that all the beneficial mutations on which adaptation is based always need to arrive de novo. The environment changes and I need to wait for the new good mutation to happen. That's not always the case. Sometimes the good stuff is already around. <clears throat> In fact, we, how do we know this or believe to know this? When we do selection experiments, for example, in fruit flies or other, exper uh, other organisms or breeding experiments, in pretty every animal or plant that we can think of, we can select for almost anything we want. I mean, crazy stuff within a short amount of time. You know this from dog breeds. You know it from pigeon breeds. We have managed to breed dogs in a short amount of time that we could maybe even think of as different species because they can't have babies with each other anymore, right? Because like the size, like, I mean, the di or pigeon breeds, like Darwin was into pigeon breeding. I'm into fruit flies and I can make fruit flies that are twice as big as a normal fruit fly is within a bunch of generations. We can double the lifespan of a fruit fly pretty much by selective breeding. That means there's genetic variants floating around in the population that selection can act upon to produce all these amazing phenotypes, at least in principle. So standing variation should not be underestimated. And so this uh, variation might already be floating around and then when the environment changes, it might become selectively favored and might sweep up in frequency. So it's usually assumed that the allele might be neutral or mildly deleterious prior to the, to the new environment. Or conversely, uh, soft sweeps might also occur if there are multiple independent mutations at the same locus that are all favored and all increase in frequency simultaneously. So this could, for example, happen if mutation rate is quite high, for example. If the favored alleles are all similarly advantageous, then typically none of the favored mutations would fix during that selective event. I mean, they would like even compete with each other maybe. And so these two soft sweep scenarios tend to be much more difficult than hard sweeps to detect using standard tests of selection. Actually, some people in this field are fighting over the importance of soft sweeps. There's people who are fans of soft sweeps and other people say like, no, it's crap. We can't, we can't really conclusively say it's a soft sweep and other people are convinced by soft sweeps. So there's like some of my colleagues who are fighting with each other about soft sweeps. For the hard sweeps, everyone is convinced that they're real. For the soft sweeps, it's a little bit more complicated. I, I'm sort of like a little bit on the fence, but like I think I tend more towards believing that soft sweeps might be important, mainly because standing genetic variation is important. If I have standing genetic variation, I don't have, uh, by definition, hard sweeps. Hard sweeps also often imply what we call complete sweeps, which means if this is the frequency of the allele, at the beginning, the beneficial thing happened de novo in one individual. And the complete sweep means it's going up to fixation. That's a complete sweep from zero to 100%. That's a characteristic of, of, of hard sweeps. But we know that there's lots of standing genetic variation we can select upon. If that wouldn't be true, we could not do plant and animal breeding. Impossible. I mean, for a cow to have the right mutation for us to increase the milk, uh, yield or meat yield, we can wait forever, right? So we know that standing variation is, is important and that's really the substrate for soft sweeps and for polygenic adaptation very often. Right, so how common or plausible are soft sweeps? So here, and we're not gonna go into details, but this slide summarizes the speed of adaptation by new mutations. So, New mutations, at what rate do they arise? So we have so far talked about zeta, which is 4n mu, right? Zeta is 4n mu. This is our measure of genetic variability. 
Now, when we have selection, we need to multiply this with another number, namely s, the selection coefficient. So this would then become zeta s, right? Because this is the rate at which new variability appears in a population by mutation times the selection coefficient if it's under selection. And so this is what is on the slide. <laughs> Thank you. No, that's fine. Um, so here, this is for haploids. That's, that's why it's 2n mu, not 4n mu. But that's the number of beneficial mutations that enter the population per generation that are under selection. But the amazing thing, and we can calculate this, but we're not going to do it in class. In approximately 30% of the time, even extremely beneficial mutations get lost. So I'm an individual, I'm lucky and I get a beneficial mutation, but I die. I get, I get hit by a car in Sao Paulo traffic before I can transmit it to my children, right? That's genetic drift. So the chance that this happens is 30% roughly. And so this is illustrated here. You see this little red line? This here is like a mutation popping up. Increases a little bit in frequency, wiggles around, bloop, goes extinct again. Then I need to wait again to have the next adaptive mutation. Bloop, pops into existence, disappears again. Then I need to wait for the third one. This also wiggles around a little bit, disappears again by drift. Okay, so here the fourth one mutates into existence, wiggles around a little bit, and only then becomes picked up by selection and follows this deterministic trajectory. So at the beginning, there's a lot of stochasticity due to drift and then deterministic selection pushing it up. But I might have a rather long waiting time here to get the right beneficial allele. And so most beneficial alleles are lost. And so that's the time for hard sweeps. There might be a long waiting time. So the cross here denotes the environmental change where selection would start to act. And so I might need to wait for a long time to get the right thing. And so the, here the mutation appears, but the mutation rate may be low. The effective population size might also be low. So this 4n mu might be a small number. And so adaptation could be mutation limited in some situations and rather slow. So here I need to wait till I have the right thing. And then it takes some time for the thing to spread. And in 30% of the cases, that red good mutation will be lost again. That's in a hard sweep. But in a soft sweep, we might be in a regime that is, that is less limiting. And so this could be, for example, because the mutation rate is higher, than, is obviously higher in some organisms than others, and or because the effective population size is very large, or because the right variants are already floating around, pre-existing, before the environment changes. And then things can go much faster. And so that's sort of, in a way, what speaks for soft sweeps. If you think about, um, so bacteria, bacteria are sort of like an interesting case because on the one hand, mutation rates can be quite high and their effective population sizes are quite high. So you could think that's like more like a soft sweep scenario, but often there it's really hard sweeps. Um, but for them, this waiting time problem is not really a problem, right? This thing here is not really a problem because they have a relatively high mutation rate and they have such a big effective population size that the combined compound probability that you get the right mutation is like very high. So that's antibiotics resistance evolves incredibly quickly. In most cases, two years after you introduce a new antibiotic, the bac bacteria will have evolved resistance in two years or less. If we look at the history, the, the last 50 years or so. And this is because they have high mutation rates and high effective population size. But there are still, in most cases, de novo mutations that will then undergo a hard sweep. But these soft sweeps are uh, not necessarily um, to be ruled out. They can be quite likely. And this is the example that I've mentioned from breeding. So this is like around Darwin's time when like in, in Victorian England, people were like into pigeon breeding and just like, you know, managed to produce all these crazy uh, pigeons. And we know this from dog and cat breeds. And there's other examples where selection is actually very strong and very fast. And a lot of my colleagues believe that in these cases, it might also be to 
could be potentially due to soft sweeps. So in general, soft sweeps might be quite relevant for rapid adaptation. A long time ago, people thought like adaptation takes millions of years or thousands of years. But like now we have many, many examples where adaptation can happen very rapidly. And so this is the case, for example, for this peppered moss based on Betularia. It's very hard to see, but here is a moss. Do you see that outline on the, on the bark? And you see this guy here. So now, you know, like about 150 years ago, you would only find this form of the moss on birch trees, on the bark of the birch trees with, with the white sort of underground. And then air pollution started to arise in, uh, in Manchester, places like Manchester and Liverpool due, due to industrialization. And then many of these trees kind of like got dark because of the, the air pollution. And you didn't have these nice lichens and white barks anymore. And so the normal form would not be well camouflaged. And so by mutation, apparently, uh, at some point, uh, this form here uh, appeared. And so here you see the increase of the black morph, the increase in frequency to almost 100%. And then once the air got cleaned again, post-industrialization, this black morph started to disappear again. And Haldane looked at some of these data that were collected by people working on this moth in the 30s and estimated the selection coefficient of 33%. It's like incredibly strong selection. And of course, we know that for pesticide and antibiotics resistance, this can evolve incredibly rapidly. So there also soft sweeps might be more likely. Even in vertebrates, we know this, like for example, in guppy fish, there's famous studies where people found evolutionary responses of these fish in Trinidad. Um, depending on which predator, fish predator they are exposed to in the jungle, they have different life history traits. They, they have different numbers of babies. It takes them different amounts of time to become sexually mature. They have different life history strategies depending on whether they're in a stream living with this predator or this predator. This predator prefers large guppy fish that are sexually mature, and this guy likes juvenile guppies. And that sets up selection pressure for the guppies to do different things depending on to which a predator they're exposed. And this guy here, David Resnick, uh, tested uh, these evolutionary differences he saw in the field, doing experimental evolution in the field, in streams in Trinidad, and found that these things can evolve in, in 10 generations in a vertebrate. So there's like many examples of rapid adaptation. And a very cool example are also the Darwin finches that I've mentioned uh, on the Galapagos. So for the last 30 years, Peter and Rosemary Grant at Princeton, they must be close to 80 now, I guess, or maybe they're 80. Um, they have gone to the Galapagos to look at these uh, different species of Darwin finches. And as you know, on the Galapagos, there's different climatic events, uh, um, La Nina and El Nino events that change the climate. And so sometimes on the Galapagos, you have extreme droughts. And if you have an extreme drought, this is going to affect the seeds of the bushes and trees that you have in the seed bank. So on the ground in the seed bank. And this is the food for some of these finches. And there's uh, different species. And uh, they, they here in this study looked at one species that is called Geospiza fortis. And what they noticed is after a drought, so they had ringed and marked all the birds. So the drought hit, and then they went back. And they found all the surviving birds. And many had died. And they measured the characteristics of the surviving birds. And what they had found is that the beak width and beak sizes of those that had survived was much higher than it was on average. So apparently, there was something about those finches that had bigger, wider beaks that helped them to survive. And the idea is that these, these bigger beaked finches, they have an easier time at cracking open large seeds. The large seeds are those that survive the drought, because during the drought, the, the small seeds don't make it. They, they're they're going to die, the, the small seeds. The small seeds don't have enough water reserves in their endosperm to survive the drought. So what you're left with are big seeds from trees that produce big seeds. But only birds with big beaks can crack them open. And that has presumably led to these shifts. 
So here, these are different morpho morphological measurements, including beak depth, which increased here. This is this, how strongly selection acts on the, this thing, or the, the, the difference, the selective difference, looking at the parental generation and then at the survivors, the difference in phenotype due to selection. And you see here, beak depth changed here in the positive direction. And then when the climate changed back again, you see back to the, to the previous situation. So there's fluctuating selection depending on when there's El Nino or La Nina events that the, the grants uh, managed to show uh, in these finches. And these things happen from one generation to the next. Another really cool example that I don't have with me is in a nature paper from a few years ago where you know these anolis lizards in the, in the Caribbean? They're very beautiful. And in some uh, islands in the Caribbean, like Hispaniola and other islands, um, there's like these anolis lizards. And when you have a, a hurricane, a tropical storm or a hurricane, these, these lizards really have to cling on to the bushes and trees. It sounds silly, right? But like they hang on there. And um, Jonathan Losos at Harvard, he did field work where he, he did the same thing. He measured anolis lizards. And he looked at how long their limbs and their tails are and how heavy they are. And then there was a tropical storm, a hurricane, and he went back and he looked at those and all his lizards that survived. And which and all his had, uh, lizards had survived? Those that had longer and stronger limbs. And then he thought like, well, maybe, this is a crazy idea, but maybe they can really cling on better to the trees and do not get blown away when there's a hurricane which is sort of a far-fetched crazy idea. But then he took these lizards to his lab at Harvard and put them into a wind, into a wind canal <laughs> where he could turn on the wind speed. And like, if you look at the supplementary materials of this nature paper, you see lizards like holding on with their long limbs to the, to the rod and he's like turning on the, the wind speed. And so he could really experimentally demonstrate that longer limbs correspond to, you know, better ability to not be blown away. And this happens from one generation to the next. It's hurricane-induced selection from one generation to the next. This is just to show that changes can happen very quickly in, in populations. There's other things here, like in stickleback fish. There's a marine form that has, uh, they have these armor, uh, body plate armors. But in the fresh water, they lose this, this armor. And so the people have figured out the genetic basis underlying these armor plates that these fish have. And in the fresh water, you see that the, that the allele that confers uh, low armor plating increases very quickly over time. So if you take fish from the marine habitat and put them into the fresh water, they lose all this sort of defense armor plating within a very uh, short amount of time. And so there's many examples like this. And also in fruit flies. So this is work that um, my colleague Paul Schmidt, uh, University of Pennsylvania is doing, where they, um, they expose fruit fly populations, like millions and millions of fruit flies in outdoor cages, and they just let them change during the season. So in, in Philadelphia, it's very hot and muggy in summer, and then in, towards fall it gets quite cold and winter and so they just track fruit fly populations over seasonal time and the phenotypes of these fruit fly populations change over seasonal time and so they can look at this at the genomic and phenotypic level and so they uh, so what the idea is that these fruit flies adaptively track the, the climatic changes over the season so in other words particular fruit fly genotypes have an advantage in some parts of the season over other genotypes and vice versa. Towards fall, some genotypes might be better than others. And, and so they can track this uh, um, at very high resolution. Right, so that's it for today, I guess. And we'll see what we'll do tomorrow. I'll think about it.